them. And so we're going to go ahead and get started. So first of all, I want to thank everyone um, for registering for our webinar and especially our presenters tonight. I'm uh, Congressman Kai Kahele, and I want to welcome all of you to this evening's webinar. Um, tonight's webinar is a, um, and hopefully it provides as much information uh, as possible from the USDA Farm Service Agency on the various programs uh, that they have and plan to share tonight um, that can help our farmers, our ranchers, and others who suffered uh, losses due to the Mono Road fire um, that happened uh, just about a week ago. You know, our hearts are, are together as we re rebuild from the more than uh, over 60 square miles of brush fire, which destroyed two homes and resulted in damages to underground infrastructure, left scorched lands vulnerable to invasive weeds, threatened livestock and more. So I wanna mahalo everyone for joining us in this evening's event. I hope it is beneficial to you, you know, your families and the community of Waikoloa, Pu'ukapu, of uh, North um, Kona, Kohala, Waikoloa, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Um, I wanna introduce a couple different people tonight that are gonna be um, uh, presenting. Uh, we have Jennifer Balderas. She is a farm loan manager with the Hawaii County Farm Loan Program for the USDA and its FSA program, which is its Farm Sur Service Agency program. We also have Kisin Tamura, uh, who is the county executive director for the Hawaii County Farm Program for the USDA FSA. Um, Jennifer will be uh, presenting on the USDA's uh, FSA loan program and uh, Kisin will be presenting on the FSA's uh, grant program. Also on our uh, webinar today is we have Dave Chun, who is my senior policy advisor on anything and everything agriculture in the state of Hawaii. He's been on Capitol Hill for a long, long time, worked for Senator Kaka, worked for former Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard, uh, and he's very knowledgeable uh, with agriculture in Hawaii, especially as it relates to the USDA. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to my communications director, Michael Ahn, who will do a quick technical rundown of how we're gonna facilitate tonight's uh, webinar um, and how we can get through the content and the presentations and then get to your questions, which I know are gonna be uh, really, really important. So. Michael is my uh, Washington DC communications director. I wanna thank him for putting this together. And at this time I'll yield to Michael. Hello, and thank you, Congressman. My name is Michael Lon and I serve as a DC communications director in the office of Rep Kai Kahele. Uh, I just wanna take a brief moment uh, to run through some of the technical components for today's Zoom webinar. Um, at, uh, after both of our presenters uh, speak, we will open up the conversation for Q and A if you have a question uh, for either of our presenters, just use the raise hand function below on the bottom bar of your Zoom screen, and that'll notify me that you have a question. Uh, once I see you have a question, I will enable your audio and call out your name as listed on, uh, on Zoom, and you will then be able to ask your question. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable with asking your question out loud, you can always write your question uh, in the chat section below at the bottom of your Zoom screen as well. Um, I'll, I'll be sure to repeat these instructions once the Q&A begins and uh, feel free to send me a message throughout the chat uh, if you have any additional questions. And so uh, with that, I will uh, then just turn it over to Jennifer who will give over uh, her presentation on load programs available through the USDA. Hey Jennifer, before you go, um, I also, for those on the presentation uh, tonight, um, uh, although she's not presenting tonight, she is on this webinar uh, listening and can help uh, with information and questions. And that's the FSA Hawaii Acting Director, Shirley Nakamura, who is also on this webinar tonight. So, you know, um, I really want to say mahalo nui loa to the USDA and the FSA team um, for, for putting this together on such short notice. And we brought the, um, we brought the subject matter experts that can hopefully um, solve uh, your problems and, and answer questions. Uh, for those affected by the fire. So thank you so much, Jennifer, and I'll uh, um, turn it over to you now. Mahalo. Okay, thank you. We did our run through, so hopefully you can see the screen uh, now. Okay. Looks great, Jennifer, we can see your screen. Okay, awesome, thank you. 
Okay, so what I'm going to present on is our farm loan programs and how hopefully we can help you get through this tough time, this recovery time possibly, or kind of be a bridge between potential farm programs that may be enacted that Keeson's going to speak about after, shortly after. So Farm Service Agency, you may know about us already. We help farmers and ranchers with loans and disaster recovery primarily. We have on the loan program side, guaranteed loans and direct loans. And our office in Hilo works for the entire county of Hawaii. And we do the direct loans. So basically we are a temporary source of credit um, for applicants who are unable to get commercial credit elsewhere. We provide the loans, we help you with the application, we review the eligibility requirements, the feasibility, whether or not you can pay for it, and then the collateral requirements for the type of loan that you're looking for as well. Our loan programs, basically we have an operating and ownership. Our emergency loan is only activated through a presidential or secretary of ag designation. Our operating loan is part, can be part of, can include a micro loan and a standard and the maximum amount um, that you can borrow can be up to 400,000 and it can help with the purchase of livestock, breeding stock, um, operating expenses. Maybe you need to repair your fences after this. Uh, you need to be by feed. Um, those kinds of things can be included in this type of loan. And then the term of the loan is between one and seven years. Our current rate for August is 1.75. And I put August in parentheses because as some of you may or may not know, our rates are issued by our national office and they change, sometimes they can change month to month. Um, but it is not a variable rate for the term of the loan. It is fixed. It's the lower of two rates, either the term time of approval or the time of closing of the loan. And then our ownership loan would go to help purchase property. It does have to be fee, or it typically is fee simple. We have not successfully been able to have a lease, a lessor sign off on our mortgage. Up to 40 years, again, that rate is at 3.25. Our application process, we provide you the application. We provide you with assistance, as I mentioned, if you need it. Um, we can send, have other resources available to you, um, the Kohala Center, the Small Business Development Center, other areas that we can try and get you assistance if we're not able to help you. And then for our complete application, we work on whether or not you're eligible for the loan, it does a cash flow, and then an approval or denial can be anywhere between that 30 to 90 day time frame. And a, a lot of it is based off the loan type, the purpose, and the environmental needs of the applicant. These are some of our eligibility requirements. The ones we usually need to discuss are having unable to get credit elsewhere, not being delinquent on any federal debt, um, and then having the education or training for the type of loan that you're applying for. This is kind of just a quick visual breakdown of what you need for each type of loan. And then there are substitutions. We can work with you on whatever the case may be. I, each applicant is an individual applicant, so there's really no standard. Everyone runs their operation differently. This rancher may not do the same thing as this other rancher. This farmer may not do the same cultural practices as another. And so we work with the applicant on an individual basis. And then we, part of the feasibility requirement is making sure you have a realistic farm business plan. And that includes completing a balance sheet, income and expenses. And then we can help you with that as well. And it is part of the application packet itself. So it's not something that you have to go work on um, a lot of, you know, go someplace else to do it. 
And basically, here's a feasible plan. At the end of the day, is it positive? Do you have enough money for what you want to do? Or you don't. And then we are, we review, you know, we do a farm assessment. We are out there with the farmer and rancher. We do a field visit. We want to see your operation. We have worked with different types of operations, entities, sole proprietorships, corporations, um, smaller farmers, larger farmers, ranchers, cattle, swine, chickens, goats. Um, we've worked with very different types of applicants and their different commodities and we work with them depending on whatever the situation may be. And as I mentioned before, you know, if we can't help you, we'll direct you to somebody else who can. Um, I do want to point out that our program is a low interest loan. It is here to help the farmer or rancher who needs it in this case to recover, whatever that may be, um, feed, fencing, infrastructure. We can discuss it on a one-on-one -on basis, one -on -one basis. Um, and kind of go over your situation and see if there's something that we can do in the meantime and between maybe programs that Keeson's gonna discuss about. And then you just have to contact us. We do have program funding right now. I, as you all know, we are uh, funded through the federal government. So our fiscal year begins October 1st, but there is funding at this point in time. And then our contact information. Jennifer, can you go back two slides to that contact page um, and then pause on this slide? But can you go back to two slides that you had on? Okay. Okay, which which side, slide again? Right at the end of the presentation. It was two slides before the end. You, you skipped over it. Um, this one. This one, how to get started? Yeah, I just want to make sure it, you, you had um, moved on to the next slide. I want to make sure that uh, the attendees. Um, oh, yes, I apologize. I kind of moved a little fast. I apologize. <laughs> Let me know um, if there's any questions, if we're doing question and answer now, if we're going to wait to the end. No, we'll wait to the end. So, okay. okay. So these are the three other types of assistance that people might be able to reach out to. One of them would be at CTAR and the UH's extension. Um, Hawaii Small Business Development, and then like uh, Jennifer mentioned earlier, the Kohala Center, and then there's a number for the Ag Mediation Program. Correct. So typically the extension service, we send applicants there in case they need additional information um, regarding maybe what to grow. They need some, they're new, um, they don't have their own records, they need to do some research. The Small Business Development Center has, we have a good working relationship with them. They have helped us to help applicants to develop their business plan, to go over the application with them as well. As well as the Kohala Center, we work really closely with Eric Bowman and have sent applicants there. They also have a microloan program that is not the federal government's rules and regulations. So in some cases, when we're unable to help the applicant, we can refer them to that agency in the hopes that they can get assistance there. Um, and then the mediation program, the Hawaii Ag Mediation Program, we've successfully referred clients to them and they've worked with them to help resolve credit issues that may be a stumbling block for our application, or they might need just a little bit of assistance there. And then we can go ahead and finish the application and do the loan for them. Great. Okay. Can you go to your, your contact now? Um, sure. Two slides forward. Okay. And this is how to contact Jennifer. Um, and uh, I guess the, uh, the next presentation will be by Keeson for the farm programs, but uh, this is their contact information. Uh, uh, at the federal building, um, many of you are familiar with in East Hawaii, it's a downtown post office building. And I think um, you guys are up on the second floor. Is that right? Jennifer? Yes. Well, we, yes, we're in room 219 on the second floor, the Mackay side of the building. Um, 
I believe Michael also has a slide of contact information with our emails as well. This is kind of the standard one that we have in our, in our screen show presentation. Okay, great. Okay. Anything else, Jennifer? Um, no, I just, I guess I want to just stress that, you know, we're here to discuss whatever the, whatever idea, whatever type of recovery the rancher thinks they might need or a farmer, if there's a farmer that's affected that was, you know, had smoke damage or some sort of other damage that necessarily wasn't directly hit by the fire. Um, to discuss maybe how we can work with you if it's possible or not, and then kind of just talk about it. So we're always here, we're available, we're open every Monday through Friday, except uh, federal holidays. So we're just, I just wanna make sure I stress that if anybody thought even that they might be interested in a loan that they, could just call us and we'll we'll discuss it and figure out what we can do. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Jennifer. We're going to jump now to Keeson. Okay, thank you. Uh, who will give us a presentation on the different farm programs, and we will uh, open it up to uh, to Q and A. So, Keeson, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, how's it going? My name is Kisin Tomora. I'm the County Executive Director for the Hawaii County Farm Service Agency uh, Farm Program side. Um, and FSA, uh, you know, the, the department that I take care of, uh, we mainly provide financial assistance for commercial farmers and ranchers affected by natural disasters. Um, the following programs pertain to federal financial assistance and um, my programs are not loans. Um, Jennifer takes care of the loan. Uh, we take care of the financial assistance program. Um, there is a link down here, farmers.gov link. Um, that takes you to pretty much access anything and everything you want to know about FSA, um, including if you're on the mainland, you know, if you want to find an FSA office on the mainland, um, there's a link down there. Farmers.gov will um, provide you a lot of information. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to go over is uh, what we call our basic eligibility documents. Um, these documents are pretty much the general documents that we need for almost all of our programs. Um, and I'm just gonna briefly go over it with you, you know, to give you an idea. Um, you know, we, when, when people do paperwork with the government, you know, it tends to be scary, but um, these documents are pretty easy to fill out. You know, and my staff and I uh, are here to help you guys fill it out as well. First document is the AD 2047. Um, this right here is just basic document to get your name, address, uh, tax ID number, um, because in order for us to do an application for you, um, my software needs to know who you are. Uh, the next form here is an AD 1026. This is a highly rotable land certification form. A lot of my programs, uh, you know, mainly if, if you're planting on highly rotable land, um, a lot of times you won't be eligible for the program. Um, in this case, you know, from the people affected by the wildfire, um, I believe it's a lot of ranchers. So, um, you know, grass, a perennial crop. It's not an annually tilled crop. So, you know, um, you guys won't have any issues um, passing this certification, completing this form. Um, next one is in a CCC-941. Uh, this is an adjusted gross income form. Um, majority of my programs require this form. And it's basically, you know, if your average adjusted gross income is greater than $900,000, uh, you won't qualify for some of my programs. Uh, another form here, the CCC-902I. This is a form that every individual completes if you are applying with us as an individual, uh, meaning if you're using your social security to file an application with us. Um, this is a form that we have you fill out. Uh, you do see a lot of information on here, uh, but don't be scared because in reality, we only use this form to determine if you're actually a US citizen and or a minor. So it's pretty simple. Name, address, answer a few questions, sign in data at the bottom. 
Uh, next form is a CCC-902E, and it only pertains to applicants that apply with us as an entity. Um, and this form here, uh, the basic of this, you know, the, the main thing about this form is, you know, getting you need to list on all the members of the entity. Um, also, um, this form has like six pages, but a couple of pages later, it, it asks you again if you're a U.S. citizen and or a minor. Um, the other form right here is, uh, you know, a lot of our programs, uh, we need land control documents, meaning, you know, we need to know that you're, um, you know, you're grazing on that land, farming or ranching on that land legally. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of verbal agreements of, you know, so-and-so let me use their land to run cattle. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, we need some kind of document to show that, um, you know, like a land ownership uh, lease agreement, or if you look at this image over here, uh, this is a CCC-855. Um, this is an FSA form that uh, an applicant can use as an annual lease certification, meaning landowner and lessee will need to sign this form. Um, and it is only good for one program year, meaning uh, January to December. And <clears throat> that is basically it for the eligibility forms. Um, you know, so I'll jump into the programs. Hey, Casey, um, had one comment about uh, um, speaking a little bit louder. I can hear you clearly, but there's some on the um, that are having a little bit hard time hearing you. If you can speak a little louder, thank you. Yeah. So this next program here is the Emergency Conservation Program. Um, this program, you know, it is implemented by. Um, our national office, meaning they're the ones who say yay or nay if this program becomes available. So the process is, is my county committee sends up a recommendation to my state director, and from there for the state director sends a recommendation up to DC. And this program is a replace and restoration program, meaning it is to restore something that was currently there before the disaster occurred. So for example, you know, if, if you didn't have any cross fences and you wanted to input some cross fences, um, this program would not allow you to do that. Uh, if you do have existing fences that existed prior to the disaster, this program can help you um, replace and restore your damaged fences. Um, also, if you have any conservation structures such as water tanks, uh, irrigation lines, things like that. Um, NRCS helps us out with this program where, you know, if you have an eligible conservation structure, uh, it gets contracted through NRCS, meaning NRCS will give you a plan as to how to install it. Uh, this program is a 75% or 90% cost shared program, meaning I look at the lesser of either what your approval amount, approval amount is or 75 or 90% of your total expense. I will pay you on the lesser of. Uh, and you ask why 75 or 90? Uh, 70, there is another form, the CCC-860 form, which we can use to certify if you're a socially disadvantaged, limited resource, or beginning farmer and rancher. Uh, also, if you're a veteran farmer and rancher, um, you can certify to that, uh, you, will, you can receive the 90%. If you can't certify any of that on that form, you receive 75%. Uh, payment limitation for this program, $500,000. Um, so you can see probably why I started off with this program is because it's probably uh, one of the main programs that will you know, really help uh, all the farmers and ranchers who were affected uh, by the wildfire. Um, all basic eligibility documents apply. So pretty much all the forms that went over except for the CCC-941, meaning if you cannot, if you do not meet the average adjusted gross income certification, then that is not a problem. Um, this program does not look at that form. Um, and also I will point out to this program is you can see at the bottom, there's three asterisks there. Uh, federal and state land is ineligible for this program. Um, so, you know, that's, I, I believe they're trying to fix that, I'm not too sure, but currently the policy is that. So, you know, un unfortunately, uh, 
currently right now any state or federal land, if this program were to become available, uh, currently it will be ineligible for this program. Uh, the next program here is the Emergency Livestock Assistance Program. Uh, and this program compensates you for a grazing or feed loss. Um, payments are based on national payment rates, and you hear that a lot. Um, pretty much all of our programs are based on national payment rates, meaning I have no control over those rates. Um, payments are based on the national payment factor of 60 or 90 percent, and there, there's two payment factors. Reason being is because that form, that CCC-860, um, you know, plays a role in this. You can certify on that CCC-860 that you're a social disadvantaged farmer, limited resource, beginning farmer, veteran, uh, you will receive the 90%. If not, you'll get the 60. Um, this program does require documentation to substantiate feed fed above normal quantities or proof of removing the livestock from the affected pasture. Um, so the bottom line is uh, we need um, hard copy records. And again, uh, this program, all basic eligibility documents apply. Next program here is the Livestock Indemnity Program. Um, this program is kind of a time sensitive program. And the reason I say that is because an applicant needs to file a notice of loss by 30 calendar days of when the loss is first apparent. Uh, acceptable documentation must be provided to substantiate the livestock deaths and injuries and also they must provide a beginning inventory. Um, and if you're wondering, um, you know, who deems these documents eligible or not, um, it, it, is, it goes to my county committee. So I do have three co uh, county committee members who review all applications and they make the call from there. And again, payments are based on national payment rates. Uh, I have an example down here. Uh, this is straight from the handbook. Um, you know, kind of gives you guys an idea of what we what we consider as eligible losses. So I'll read it out to you. Uh, <clears throat> does pertain to a wheat field. I don't think we have that here, but it is straight from my handbook. So uh, fire started in a wheat field. The fire spreads to nearby native pasture, and as a result, livestock are injured or killed. Unless the fire was spread and became a wildfire due to extreme, abnormal, and damaging weather, straight line winds, for example, a fire would not be considered a wildfire under the definition of eligible adverse weather event. So those three programs, um, you know, I started with those because they, they mainly pertain to the wildfire. Um, you know, those aren't the only three programs that FSA has to offer. We do have a lot. Um, and these programs right here, there's four additional programs that are included and they do not directly pertain to the wildfire, but you know, it's currently available right now. You know, if you wanted to apply, you can. Uh, I have the Livestock Forage Program, which pertains to a designated drought within the county. So June 28th, the US Drought Monitor kind of flipped the flag for us and said that, hey, Hawaii County, you've been in D2 for eight consecutive weeks. Um, that means um, all commercial ranchers, you know, who graze animals are eligible to receive a subsidized payment. Uh, the next one is a coronavirus food assistance. Uh, that program uh, is, is um, you know, uh, it's special because it's, it's only available to Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. And the reason it's available to us is because pretty much everything needs to be shipped to us. So this program, it uh, compensates you a small percentage for the shipping costs of you know, anything. Yeah? Uh, for example, if you were to go to Walmart, you buy a shovel for $10, the price tag doesn't tell you that a dollar or 50 cents pertain to the shipping costs. So this program here, um, anything uh, pertaining to your farming operation is eligible for this program and it is reimbursable. Our last program <clears throat> is a non-insured crop disaster assistance program. Uh, we call it, it's kind of like crop insurance, but we don't call it that. We call it a super long name. 
Um, but it is kind of like crop insurance and it is for uh, your crop. So, you know, a lot of ranchers come and ask me, is this insurance for my cattle? No, it's insurance for your grass. So it's for the crop. Um, and I think that would be it. Um, I leave you with this last message. Uh, failure to provide complete and accurate information and records could result in ineligibility for FSA programs for the year or multiple years. Um, being liable under any civil or criminal fraud statute or any statute of provision of law. Um, that is my last slide. And my contact information is down there. Uh, my staff's information is down there. Uh, our office consists of um, four people. So, yeah. All right, thanks, Keeson. Um, I know we have a bunch of questions and I'll have Michael uh... I guess moderate that or at least ask the question we can get answers to. Yes, uh, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, I've just added uh, another screen over here. This is just some uh, general contact information for our, our two presenters, uh, Dave Chun in our office, as well as our Hawaii district office. Um, I will go ahead and start. I have been noting down folks' questions. I'll start with our first question, which was from Laura. Um, to Jennifer, and she asked, can the microloans be used to rebuild homes? The microloan can be used to rebuild a home um, as long as it's a uh, part of the ranch, commercial ranching operation. And then it, it, it can go both ways. It can go two ways. We can do it as an operating loan where it's $50,000 or less, as long as depending on the amount that you need to rebuild it is meets that $50,000 limit and it's payable within seven years. For that, um, the collateral does not need to be the land. So it kind of depends on whether or not your land is fee simple or if it's a leased property. Um, if it's a leased property, then we would need to look at other items for collateral to secure the loan. We can look at tractors, machine, other machinery and equipment, vehicles, um, other, other people can pledge collateral for you. Um, as long as it meets that 100% requirement of whatever you're borrowing is 100% is that we can secure it. The other option would be to do a farm ownership loan, which the term at that point can go up to 40 years. And that would be just to figure out whether or not you need that longer repayment period. Unfortunately, that's where we get into a land issue. Um, if it is leased property, then the ownership loan, we wouldn't be able to use that property because we cannot secure a mortgage on it. Um, or we have it successfully in the past. Um, so in that case, it kind of, it would depend on what your specific needs are and what the land is. Alrighty, um, I'll just go on to the next question from uh, Mahana for uh, Jennifer as well. Um, or I apologize, it might be for Kison. Uh, how do we get you out here to our individual lots? What do we need to do as leases to start the process of the emergency conservation programs? Uh, so I'll take that one. Um, <clears throat> well, currently right now, um, as of today, the emergency conservation program is not available. Um, what I do recommend, you know, is, you know, do take pictures, do document stuff. Um, now, I, I will say this, I do not guarantee anything, um, but you know, if it does ever become available in the future, um, and most likely in the near future, um, we, you know, one of my staff will come out, will do the field assessment, um, and then, you know, if you guys started cleaning up some stuff, uh, you know, we'll ask you for some pictures as well. Uh, but again, the emergency conservation program, there is a process to getting that program open. As I said, um, my county committee will send the recommendation up to my state director. My state director will send it up to Washington, DC, and then we wait for the, the call from there. So Keeson, what, where are we in that process to get this approved? Well, 
Uh, currently, my next county committee meeting is set, is set for September 10th. Um, and, you know, from, from there on, uh, all three members will get together and they'll discuss it and we'll send everything up to our state director at that time. Okay, I mean, is it, considering that this is an, is an emergency, is there any way you guys can meet before September 10th? Um, yeah, uh, of course, sure can. Uh, uh, yeah, I know you can't speak for your other committee members, but you know, if, if you could talk to them and see if there's a way that, uh, um, it, it, if it, you know, today's August 12th, right? So September 10th is in like, that's a month from now, which for some people that have, um, you know, incurred damages is, is an eternity. Um, if there's a way to, to meet a little bit sooner, that would be great, um, as provided we have the necessary information so that the committee can make, you know, um, right. the best decision. Great, I'll just move on to the next question. Uh, this is from Penny to Keeson. We applied for uh, this program ECP and was rejected because it was not a D3 level drought. Um, uh, that is the wrong program. Um, you did not apply for ECP uh, that pertained to the emergency livestock assistance program. And the reason being is you were not eligible is because in the handbook for that program, what you applied for was for water hauling. Uh, in the handbook, it specifically says that there needs to be a D3 drought uh, in order to be eligible for water hauling. Uh, at that time, county committee reviewed the US drought monitor and there was no D3 drought. So that's why you are not eligible for that program. Great, and then uh, I have a raised hand from Marion. Uh, Marion, I'm going to allow you to speak so you can go ahead and ask your question. Um, and you should have gotten a notification to uh, be able to unmute your mic. Marianne, are you there? Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and move on. Uh, Marianne, if you have a, another question later, you can please just put it in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll get back to you. Um, next question is from Lokelani um, and uh, is directed to you, Kison. Did I hear that correctly state or federal lands are ineligible? Yes, that is correct. And, um, you know, I know a lot of DHHL land uh, was involved in the fire, but that's what the policy is right now. Got it. Um, next question is from Travis uh, to Keeson. Will ECP be available for this fire event? So um, as I mentioned before, currently it is not available. Um, we will go through the process of trying to get it open. Um, and as I said, um, final call comes from Washington, DC. Hey, Keeson, I have a question going back to Lokilani's um, uh, question about the ineligibility of state or federal lands. Is that um, an administrative rule? Is that, um, where, where, where does that determination exist? So for the emergency conservation program, um, we have our handbook, uh, it's one ECP. Um, and it is public, so you can find it, find it on the farmers.gov site, but it is in there and it does specifically say that federal and state land is ineligible for that program. So it's not something that I made up off the back of my head, but um, it's actually written in there. My only thought is uh, one of the things that, um, you know, we may be able to, or, or we should actually think about addressing is even though it is uh, state or federal lands in this, in this particular case, if it was considered federal lands because it's DHHL lands, I mean, this is not the same as federal lands on the mainland or on the CONUS that are not um, a part of the, DHHL inventory, you know, that goes to our indigenous, um, you know, native Hawaiian community. I mean, I think there's a big difference be between those lands that 205 or thousand plus acres of DHHL lands that are um, uh, used for native Hawaiian homesteadings for the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act versus federal lands that exist, you know, in uh, some other law, for example, or some of the lands that the army and the military has. 
so that would that would be something that I would want to inquire about because I clearly it does affect people in pool couple who um, based on that policy would be ineligible to use that program correct correct yeah I mean that's something that we should we should address yeah so so that that's something um you know like I said um you know my job is to follow what's in the policy right there yeah. um I don't have the flex if I do flex too much I lose my job um, so yeah, we don't that. yeah so that we'll you know that's, that, that's that's some that's something um you know my state office can hash out with um, the national office and you know we can get their recommendation and um, you know we, we can go from there Great. Dave, can you look into that? Yes, we'll do. We'll okay. Do so. Okay, Michael, next question. Great. Um, next question is uh, uh, Michael Hodson uh, raised his hand. So I'm going to go over and unmute you, Michael. Um, give me one second. Uh, you should be allowed to talk. <clears throat> All right, you can hear me. We can hear you. All right, aloha, I'm Mike Hudson. Uh, I represent Waimea Hawaiian Homestead Association, a nonprofit 51C3, and Waimea Nui, a registered homestead beneficiary association with the Department of Interior. In this situation, extreme weather conditions, specifically high winds, came out of nowhere, you know, coupled with extreme drought in our uplands of Waimea, normally known as the best grazing lands in our community. It had extreme fuel to the equation and made it impossible to control. You know, Mother Nature took its course and devastated 240,000 acres of prime ranch lands, of which a portion of these lands were trust lands set aside under the Hawaiian Homes Commission after 1921. You know, recovery is the key takeaway, I, I feel, that I want to emphasize. I believe the ECP was designed for just this. And if we take no action, further devastation will occur, specifically in the soil erosion. You know, wildland fires, as we all know, are a force of nature and take, take on their own weather patterns and are nearly impossible to prevent as they're difficult to control. And that's was the case on July 30 to August, August 5th, 2021. Our trust lands are substantially underserved and are extremely economically depressed and socially disadvantaged community. Our Native Hawaiian families on trust lands, to be started without the help of FSA and NRCS, it will, it will take decades and even generations. So I strongly request your consideration in clearing this situation as an ECP to get our people immediately help. You know, we are predominantly dealing with trust lands, nearly identical to that of Native American and Alaska Native trust lands, with the exception that the State Department of Hawaiian Homelands was entrusted to manage the day-to-day -day operation of the trust until such time the reestablishment of our Native American government is created. Mm -hmm. DHHL issues awards with 99-year leases. Our association is willing to work with FSA and NRCS to help expedite these services. You know, I do know that, I think it's Zach, I hard time pronounce his name, the uh, FSA director in Washington, D.C. He's well aware of trust lands, not being federal or state lands, but held in trust for our Native Hawaiian people. So I, I believe that uh, he will consider uh, and this and, and allow this ECP program to be established. So my, my question is, what is the process of making a determination? I, be, I believe you, you answered it on whether it becomes an ECP. So I guess that comes from Washington, D.C. You know, if we do have this ECP designation, which, we, which will give us immediate assistance, you know, we would like to work with uh, local FSA office and NRC office, as well as DHHL, to help our beneficiaries sign up for the programs and fill out and turn in all documents needed to get them started. And I would like to create some kind of cheat sheet document and information that you would need for our members so that they could bring and complete the applications on site one time. Many of our um, members have gone through the process of filling out applications, and because it's lengthy and, and cumbersome, um, they don't return them. And uh, I've been dealing with that situation with our lessees for, for about a decade now. So I would like to have, hopefully, if this ECP pro program is established, the ability to work with your office and bring our lessees together and, mm -hmm. and do some kind of um, um, workshop to this with some type of like universal form so that we can make sure that we get all the documentation. Mahalo. Hey Mike, thanks for the um, uh, comments. And uh, 
you know, you heard what I said earlier, and I, I looked at the chat, um, and Dave already has that, those marching orders. So we're going to find out what we can do in Washington, D.C. to help Keeson and the local office with that uh, determination, because I do agree that's something that needs to be um, looked at and addressed. Great. I'll just go to our next question. Uh, this is from Mahana. Uh, Kison, has the wind and drought been acknowledged by FSA uh, for Pu'ukapu? Yes. In other words, um, we knew that area was dry. Um, you know, kind of common sense. You see it in the media, yeah, that it was dry and there was strong winds. Um, so we, we, we know that. We're aware of that. Uh, next question is from Lokelani. Uh, for the transportation program, is gas or fuel covered? Yes, just as long as it pertains to your farming operation, it is eligible. Great. Uh, next, I have uh, uh, Herbert uh, with a raised hand. So Herbert, I'm going to go ahead and just allow you to talk. Um, let me know if you uh, see the notification to uh, speak. Yes, I have. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, hey, aloha. thank you. Aloha, Councilman. How are you? Thank you so much, Congressman, for putting this together. And, and thanks to everybody. Thank you, FSA, for putting forth all the information. Uh, quick question. Can we get a list either that hot links to all these different programs that we can put out for our members, for our, our constituents, so they can run through this. You put out a lot of information very, very quickly. So if we can have some sort of uh, cheat sheet and Congressman, if you could, maybe get, we can get it through your office and we can help pass that out and get it to our people. Yeah, we'll, we'll do, I have my staff, uh, I have multiple members of the staff on this. So I'm gonna ask if Keeson and Jennifer can both share their presentations to my office and we will um, pull the information out and create a one-stop shop cheat sheet and. Uh, I guess we would just need to know uh, who to distribute it to. So hopefully if you registered for the webinar, we have your email information. If not, put it into the chat and we can capture it uh, right now. And we'll make sure we get you that uh, cheat sheet with those links to these sites. Yeah, I'm just gonna hop in there too. Uh, thank you. Oh. No, yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, and just uh, so just everyone knows, we do have uh, all the emails collected. Uh, if you RSVP'd for our webinar. So we'll be sure to uh, follow up with that. And we will have a recorded uh, a recording of this entire conversation, uh, which we'll make available online. Okay, uh, thank you so much. And our next uh, is Mahana with a raised hand. So I'm gonna go ahead and allow Mahana to speak. And Mahana, let me know if you, uh, if you can uh, speak. Can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, it's a little uh, uh, distorted. Is this, is this better? Yeah, a little mm -hmm. better. Yeah, go ahead. So I just, I wanna, I wanna talk on what Mike Hudson had to say. Is that at this point, we're all here on the ground we saw what happened. And so if we are being classified in, in a federal and um, state jurisdiction that there is no coverage for that kind of land, we did not have federal resources or state resources available to us. And we have video footage, we have photography, of what happened and we had none of those resources available to us. So at what point is that considered when putting us in that bracket that federal lands and state lands don't qualify? For, for me, is that if that's the case, then we should have the same resources that were offered to private and federal and state, but we didn't. And so my question is, when does that get identified? and acknowledged because we did not. And there is enough of us that witnessed that, that we were here to fend for ourselves where we should have had those kinds of resources. And that's my, my question.
Could, could you hear me? Yes, Mahana, I, we could hear you loud and clear. And I think um, our, our panelists are probably figuring out who to answer that question. I, I don't necessarily think that's uh, the USDA or Jennifer or Kieson. Um, and uh, I will have to get back to you on that. You know, we've, I'll, uh, I can check with the County of Hawaii and the emergency management agency there, but I don't have an, I don't have a clear answer for you right now on that. Thank you. Okay, I have uh, Michael Hudson uh, with uh, his hand raised. Uh, go ahead and I'll allow Mike to speak. Okay, I'm back. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure what Mahana was asking, but um, I, I believe what she's asking is that, I, I'll give you the factual information. If you don't know that, I was an investigator, a detective for 27 years, so I, I know how to investigate. And during this process of the investigation, you know, the county, the county fire department battalion chief requested DOFA's assistant from the state. And, and the state's attitude was, well, that's not, Hawaiian homes is not state lands. So they had to go to civil defense in the county to get the approval from civil defense in the state, who then had to go to the attorney general for approval before they actually sent DOFA out for assistance. By that time, it was Saturday. You know, a lot of the damage already done. You know, we, we're not treated the same. So if there's a confusion between the federal and state on whose lands it is, as we know, it's trust land set aside for the Native Hawaiian people until such time that our government is reestablished. Um, we shouldn't continue this confusion between the federal and state government on whose lands this is. And I think that's the whole problem in a nutshell. Nobody understands whose lands this is. Because of that, we don't get the kind of assistance that we normally would get if we was on fee simple county lands or uh, we're having pro uh, private property lands. And, and I think that's the frustration us, us beneficiaries have living on trust lands. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, next, I have Shirley Nakamura. Uh, Shirley, I said, you got your hand raised, so let's go ahead and I'll, I'll allow you to talk. Shirley, can you, uh, um, are you able to talk? Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I didn't click the unmute button. Um, hi, everybody. I'm acting state executive director for FSA right now. Um, I, I heard your comments about um, lease land and federal and state lands not being eligible. And um, from what I understand, our national office, they know it's a nationwide issue. They're looking into it and hopefully we'll hear back on the issue. I will ask my staff to go find out the status of it and see what we can do. If not, um, there may be something else we're gonna we can do um, to see if our DHHL lessees and those lands can be eligible. I know it's like a 99 year lease, so it's almost like it's land that is owned by um, the individual farmers and ranchers. So you know we we will look and see we'll look into it and see what we can do and see if we can press the issue and maybe speed up um, some kind of decision or uh, a decision on it. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. I have Mahana. Um, I'll go ahead and allow you to speak. Uh, go ahead and if you can uh, unmute. So I just wanted to call what Mike said. I back that completely but what i want to say is that while we are trying to make all these decisions there are people still living on the ground right now staying up 24 7 to put out hot spots on their own dime their own vehicles so whatever can be done at a federal state level to expedite this the people of the land know what's going to be done and they're doing it 
no matter what it costs. So the decision makers, if you can like help us to expedite this and not get caught up in it, we are clear who we are, where we are, what we are. The question is, government, are you, and can you help us to hurry it up? Because we are the ones on the ground leading this. Whatever rules you put in place, whatever we have to follow mythology, we are living it. Can you hurry up to catch up? And that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Maha. Okay, um, I have uh, Marianne. I'll go ahead and uh, uh, enable your um, audio. And go ahead. All right, I have two questions there and more pointedly, I want uh, someone to identify the law or policy which allows the discrimination for assistance between private owned lands and state and federal lands. Who's gonna do that? Aaron, can you ask your question again? What is the, please identify the law or policy which allows for the discrimination of assistance between private owned land and federal and state land. I don't think any of us can answer that question right now, Marion, but we've clearly heard the message from Mike and others and my office will look into it and Shirley will look into it. Great, that's what needs to be done. Thank you. Great, I have uh, another question from uh, Lokilani um, and is, are there micro grants available to help in the gap until the loans catch up? Um, so I, I'll just say that um, my agency won't, I mean, I know it sounds like grants, but um, technically it's not a grant. Uh, we just look at it as financial assistance. Um, but I, I, I guess to answer your question is, Maybe, um, you know, there are other programs that are available that do not pertain to the wildfire that you that are open right now and you can apply for. Um, so, but, you know, any, any type of financial assistance directly pertaining to the wildfire, um, like immediately as in like, if I can pay you, cut you a check right now or tomorrow, I don't really have anything currently. Okay, uh, and that concludes all of our questions so far. Uh, if you haven't asked a question or you want to uh, ask a question, uh, please uh, utilize the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen, or you can uh, type your message out in the chat. We'll wait a, a few more minutes for folks who uh, wanna ask any other questions. While we're waiting for that, I wanna hand it over to Dave. Dave, can you give us an update on your end? Uh, I know you've been working on stuff and um, uh, While we're waiting for any additional questions, Dave, can you uh, turn on, on your mic and give us an update? Sure, thank you, Congressman. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, team. Uh, hey, hey, by the way, I also wanna note to everybody on the call, um, Dave right now is in Washington, DC, and you can just add six hours to seven o'clock PM and you'll get to figure out uh, what time it is right now where Dave is. So Dave, thank you so much for being on this uh, this uh, webinar tonight. We really appreciate it. I know it's early in the morning in DC for you. Thank you, Congressman. This is what we do. We provide customer service. You are our customers and we are public servants to help. Um, you know, uh, the the big issue, and I'm I, sorry, my, my freeze, had, my, my, uh, my uh, computer had frozen up, my connection had frozen up. So you might have touched this more in detail earlier, but the, 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 the main issue is this, the designation of whether this was a man-made or a natural disaster uh, fire. Uh, during the moments when my connection was frozen, did, did you folks address this in detail? No. Could, could we, could we, because uh, th this is the feedback that's coming. I mean, a lot hinges on, on natural disaster versus a man-made fire. 
So for example, so, some community members have raised the issue of, well, look, uh, what if uh, I'm uh, smoking a cigarette and uh, it's a nice, beautiful day on Mana Road, then all of a sudden the, the wind just blows over and there's a spark that's lit on the grass. Is that a man-made disaster or is that a natural disaster because the wind suddenly picked up? Could, uh, so it was this and, and similar kind of uh, examples that uh, members of the community had brought up. But could, could you uh, uh, talk to that? Dave, who are you directing that towards? Uh, to uh, both Jennifer and, and Heeson, and as well as uh, Acting Director Nakamura, because a lot, a lot hinges on this. Okay, can you repeat your question, uh, just in case uh, Jennifer Keeson didn't uh, fully so, know what you were asking? So, the determination of a natural disaster versus a man-made disaster, because that is a question at the hand before us. Uh, some are saying this is a man-made disaster, therefore it is not eligible for uh, a number of different federal funding streams. Whereas if it was a natural disaster, that's another story. For the, I'll just speak really briefly because I think um, this pertains maybe more to Keeson's programs. Our loan programs um, for the operating or the ownership loan, the emergency designation as far as the um, fire goes, that that's not really re relevant. It's more, I guess, where it, how it started is not really relevant. It's more so where are you at now and how can we help you for our loan program? Keeson? Um, Shirley Nakamura actually has her hand up. Um, she said she will respond to that question. So if uh, Mike, could you? Michael, can you open it, Shirley? Yep, she should be able to talk. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, great. Um, yes, we had a discussion about this. We, re we realized maybe the initial start of the fire was man-made. Um, however, we will request still that ECB be approved and I'll support that based on the fact that it was drought conditions, which isn't man-made. And there, there were some high winds that time. Um, it will depend upon our national office approving it, but we're, we're hopeful that it will get approved. So, um, and if not, we will go back and um, try and, you know, plead our case to um, say that it was, um, it should qualify for ECP, so. Well, that, 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 that is new, that should be music to many folks here that, uh, uh, that you'll be fighting fighting this issue in Washington D.C. Uh, because that was that was part of a lot of feedback that had come back uh, over the, over the past week. But thank uh -huh. you very much. Okay, thanks for bringing that up. But yes, we will be um, pushing forward for approval that way once it goes through the process, which is the county committee, and then up through me. Thanks. Got it. Thank you. And Shirley, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and just keep you uh, uh, permitted to talk just because I believe you may have some uh, good insight on some of these questions that might be asked uh, in the future. Uh, Penny, I will go ahead and allow you to talk as well. So go ahead and you should be able to ask your question. Thank you so much for your patience. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I first like to comment, and I know we've got a lot of echoing in the background, so I hope everyone can hear. But I'd like to comment on the urgency of our situation out here. And while we can appreciate all of the programs that USDA offers on a no normal basis, we are in an emergency situation. And I'd like to ask Kaysen, have you been out here, or Jennifer, have you been out here physically to see what this area looks like? I'll speak for me. Um, no, I haven't been out that side. 
Jennifer? I have not either. All right. My point is we cannot wait. I can appreciate uh, Mike Hudson, Mike Ahele, Shirley Nakamura, um, all those that have shared the urgency. Now, uh, what I want to stress, and I hope you can hear me, alone in this situation is not what all these homesteaders are looking at, okay? Um, unless the ECP program will allow for this particular fire to be considered a natural disaster, none of the homesteaders will be able to succeed. There's so much damage that was done by this fire. And we cannot wait till September, Kaysen. And I hope that maybe if you took a drive out here, you would see how bad the drought was prior to the fire. Now it's black. The ground is burnt. And I know I've communicated with your office and you have rejected my application um, in the past for different programs. And it's always a question that needs to go back to the uh, federal government. So in this situation, I know um, it's, a, it's, it's an urgency. We, we're trying to stress to you, if you want to be of any help, we cannot wait. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Penny, for your um, uh, comments. And I, I think, um, you know, we will work together with Kaysen and Jennifer and Shirley and the team uh, to try and expedite and, and also the uh, additional committee members. I'm not sure who those individuals are, but um, I think we really understand this, the sense of urgency here. And uh, if that takes trips out to um, Kapu, that's something you know we'll, we'll try and work on uh, with their team to do that. And then with Dave's help, we'll work on it in Washington, DC. We know how, this, how important this program is for um, those that were affected so that this can be approved in that program. All righty, I will go ahead and uh, allow uh, Mahana to speak. Go ahead, Mahana. Okay, so I'll keep it short and sweet. We all from Hawaii and we know that Hawaii does not allow room for double standards. We live this land. So all I'm going to close with is that all these rules, this policy, where funding coming from whatever, is one way. But the resources and the, the ability to fight this fire was literally less than that. So all I'm going to say is that can we stop the double standard? If the standard is going to be, we're going to do what we're going to do for the people and this land, no matter what the bureaucratic tape is, we're going to figure it out and do it. But I am living a double standard that the rule says federal and state land are not eligible, but I live in a land where federal and state resources were not available. So all I'm asking for my neighbors, myself, the next generation is, can we please stop this double standard? And if that means changing policy, let me know what I can do, what my neighbors can do to help change the policy. Because it is a policy that is holding back the Ford movement because it is a double standard. I've lived it. My neighbors have lived it. Our children have lived it. You are all living it right now with us on this call. It is a double standard that we cannot let go any further. We need to focus on what do we do to change that. 
there's no room for double standards. Because if we set the standard, there is only one. We follow more. We move forward. But you folks are the decision makers. We are the people on the ground. Collectively, I believe and I know we can do it. But we have to stop hiding behind false pretenses that it's just a policy. No. Let's acknowledge the double standard and change the policy. And that's all I got to say. Mahalo. Thank you, Mahara. We're going to work our hardest to change that policy. That's all I can say, at least for tonight. All righty. I have one more hand raised from Michael. Uh, Michael, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to talk. Okay, this is in response to Dave, uh, Dave Chung. Hey, Dave, thanks for staying up um, and uh, working diligent on, on this, this process. And it's, it's been over a week with you. Um, I think what you miss when you got disconnected is that under the um, emergency um, program, federal and state lands don't apply. But there's many areas in USDA law that identify uh, Why Knows Commission Act trust lands in the same category as Native American and Alaska Native lands. And I think that issue has got to probably come up with, um, I, I believe he's the SA, FSA director, Zach, Zach uh, Dushana. Um, and, and he's well aware of tribal lands, being that he's from South Dakota and he's a tribal member in the, of the Sioux Nation. That our trust lands is technically not federal and state lands. So hopefully uh, they uh, that that that's one of the issues. I think we have good support with the uh, FSA office in, in this county and uh, FSA office statewide on identifying that natural causes and uh, God made causes that created this damage. And um, let's not um, let's let, let's hope that this state and federal lands not eligible doesn't apply to this. And I think that's the big takeaway I get um, for you, Dave. Mahalo. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, we'll, we'll brief Dave on that. And um, again, we'll work with the USDA team on that. I 100% I agree with you, Mike. And so if there's anything I learned tonight, it's that. And so we're on it. Okay, I have uh, Marianne with her hand raised again. Let's go ahead and uh, uh, commit to speak. I would like to suggest that Ms. Holland from the Department of Interior be included in this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marion. I have a good relationship with Secretary Holland. So um, if and when we got to pull her in to, to assist with this, I, I um, assure you I will, I will do that. Anything else, Mike? I believe, that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> I believe that's uh, all of our questions right now. I'll give uh, folks just one more minute to uh, raise their hand if they have one last question, uh, but it looks like okay. we are- Can you do me a favor, Michael? Um, can you pull in uh, Councilman Tim Richards? Um, yes. Let me go uh, ahead and- Not necessarily put him on a spot, but uh, you know, I know he's been working really hard um, ever since his fire started. He might have an update or some information to share from the perspective of the county and the county council. You know, there's um, uh, a process with um, AIMA and with FEMA and, and that component of it. I don't necessarily know what would or would, would not qualify, but Council, Councilman Richards, you want to give an update to anyone on this since we have an audience and we still have a good solid almost 45 people that are participating. Yeah, th thanks, Congressman. And um, <clears throat> listening and listening very carefully to the whole conversation, uh, I think what Dave put forth and having this determination and be sure that we carry that message going forward, that this is truly a, a um, act of nature and why it got away from us and, and going forward. Also listening very carefully to the designation, how we're going to handle taking care of Pu'ukapu and the Hawaiian homestead lands. Um, I think this is also a message we have to carry forward. I think um, I've, I've talked to the mayor about this and I had a debriefing with the um, police, uh, excuse me, fire chief yesterday. And we're in the phase right now of 
assessing what total uh, damages and needs from the damages occurred right now. I, I did discuss with the mayor about taking this and uh, based upon the conversation we had, Congressman, with you and with Dave Chun uh, going forward and having that designation of a federal disaster that has to go up through the chain, has to go up through the governor, but the mayor is very supportive and I discussed him with it as far as taking this through the governor and then up to DC. Um, it's my belief that we need to take this to the president. And as I understand it, that if we can get a secretarial designation, but I think it's more important to get a, a um, presidential designation because that will trigger all the departments. So we've heard about Department of Interior, Department of Ag. Uh, as we've discussed, I'm concerned about the environment as well. And so I think from a bunch of different perspectives that we need to take this high and quickly. And I'm very sensitive to the needs. Councilwoman Sue Leloy has also been listening to this. And um, we are working on the, the near-term needs, which is getting help on the ground. You know, my cousin has articulated those. Mahana has articulated those. We have to get help now for people to get from point A to point B. The follow-up is the, the bigger things. And I realize that the federal money takes time to get there, but we have the near term and then the long term that we have to do. But time is of the essence. And you know, Congressman, I appreciate you stating that the sooner we get um, the FSA, the local committee together to make a determination so we can go forward, the better. But that still doesn't address right away. So we're working very, very diligently. Again, we have uh, more calls tomorrow concerning this exact conversation and how we can go forward. Mayor is fully supportive of taking this designation as high as we can. And so I'll be working on that with your office uh, to take it as far as we can. Does that answer all your questions, sir? Yeah, it does. And I really appreciate that. Um, hey, Michael, can you pull in Lokilani Leloy? I, I, I'm sorry, I, um, I missed... Uh... I miss Councilwoman Leloy on, but yes, while uh, while that while she's coming on, and I'll give her a chance to say a few words. I mean, we, we do have to move very very quickly on this, and I think uh, the sense of urgency is apparent. And on the county side of the house, working together with Mayor Roth and trying to capture the losses um, from all the different affected, uh, you know, individuals, ranches, farms in this area. Is, is what we need to capture so that the mayor's office and the governor's office ultimately through Haima, uh, and if that's the route we have to go, and then when the delegation can come together, and I'm working closely with um, Senators Hirono, Senator Schatz, and uh, Congressman Case's office uh, on this. And I know, um, I think I saw earlier, um, Dale Hahn from Senator Schatz's office was on the call as well. And so, there's, there's many people that have heard um, the sense of urgency that needs to happen. And if we as a delegation um, need to work with the governor's office to uh, convey that sense of urgency to the White House and to try and trigger an emergency presidential declaration, then I'm totally committed to do that. So I think there's, a, there's multiple um, uh, irons in the fire here. Uh, clearly we can use uh, the designation to be relooked at um, and, and maybe the USDA FSA team, uh, if, if, if time permits and they're available, can make that trip uh, up to Waimea to, to really see firsthand the, the damage um, uh, that people have incurred. Uh, Councilwoman Leloy, thanks for joining us and being on all night uh, on this call. Do you have anything to add uh, that Councilman Richards uh, um, didn't cover? Um, thanks, Kai. Thanks for taking that 30,000 foot look with all the work that needs to happen at our federal level. I'm very focused, along with Councilmember Richards, to look at something a lot closer and quicker. Um, we're looking at micro grants. We're looking at Hawaii Community Foundation. You know, uh, today there, there was just a number of amazing partners who have stepped up that were trying to close the gap as far as getting everybody uh, some resources immediately until these loans and all these other applications come through. Um, you know, my office and Tim's office has partnered to provide some contingency relief monies and Mike, uh, Mahana, you know, we have nine council members and Tim and I are there, but 
you guys should also reach out to Holeka Inaba, um, just other council members who are Native Hawaiians who would understand the need and the urgency. And they also have contingency monies too. Um, and this is a way to infuse money immediately into Pukapu and some of the needs for the district while these other things get worked out. Um, that's all I have to offer. And, you know, I continue to stand ready to help, especially our homestead community. You know, I'm a homesteader down here in Panaeva. So everything everyone spoke about, about the double standards, um, we live it too. And I get it. So whatever I can do to help to remedy that, I'm ready to do that. Great. Thanks, Kai. No, thank you so much. And, you know, for myself sitting here right now, I still don't understand the uh, extent of the damage, not by going there and looking at the damage, but by having the damage documented per individual, uh, per individual household, individual farm, individual ranch. I, we don't, I don't still have that captured. And um, normally like with lava in 2018 or um, on Oahu when there's a flood that, each individual homeowner, rancher, farmer would go into the particular county's emergency site that they would have um, uh, built and, and it would be activated. And that's where you can put in all of the information for the losses that you've had. So that I really need at my level to package that together to be able to present that to the delegation and the higher administration to say, here's the loss uh, that we have. And here is uh, the unintended consequences if we don't do something uh, in the near future uh, due to soil runoff and all the second and third um, order of, of effects, uh, not just a primary fire loss, but what will happen in the long term in terms of the heads of cattle, um, the, diff the loss of grazing lands and all of those things. That all needs to be quantified. And I don't have that yet. So uh, Councilman Richards or, or Lee Lloyd, can you speak to any of that? Do you know how we're capturing that at the county level? Um, Tim, are you on? I, I'll jump in real quick. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, I, I know. I'm here. Go, Sue. Go first. Oh, well, no, no, no. I mean, go ahead, Tim. Go ahead. Well, you know, Congressman, that's the concern. And you've heard the Pukapu ranchers discussing that. They are putting it together and, and again, working with them to articulate that, to get a final number. But, um, you know, listening to all the federal programs is great, but we've lost fence lines, we lost water lines, we've lost grazing capability. I know a lot of animals have been moved, moved and partnered out. We talk about transportation and, you know, with, with all due respect, um, Keeson, you talked about you have a committee that certifies things. I'm thinking to myself, how do we certify um, things that happen very quickly, sometimes in the dark? H how do we come back very, very quickly to get that? So those assessments are being done currently. The problem is, is um, we've got to get the funds to these ranchers and some farmers quickly to keep them in business now while we catch up to that final assessment. And um, that's still being done. And I would expect that we'll start seeing some numbers probably by the end of next week that are actually starting to make sense, but we're still putting those numbers together. And, you know, Mahana articulated, they're still fighting fire. This isn't POW yet. They're still babysitting the fire. So until we get that behind us, um, asking for an assessment is a little tough when they're still putting out hot spots. So, but we still got to keep them going. And we have a lot of um, guys that jumped in. I was talking to the fire chief, like I said, I think 27 bulldozers were working at one point. And a lot of these guys are, um, you know, some of the big companies like Isimoto and Goodfellas and all, but some are, are like Rivera. He doesn't run a lot of bulldozers. A lot of these guys just jumped in to help take care of Kukua, get things done. And they help get our arms, and I say our collectively, around this fire. But they also, they did it, you know, with no great expectation of immediate funds. But we do need to come back and help take care of those guys. We still haven't put all those numbers together yet. We're getting there. But it's going to be a little while before we get those numbers. Because, again, the fire's not pow yet. They're still working on it. 
Kai, and if I could jump in, I know Civil Defense, Fire, Mike Hudson has already started to collect that, which is why that critical path for tallying the damages lies within that universal form. And so, you know, I'm working hard to borrow the information that we had from Lava Recovery to create that universal form, working with Mike and Mahana to get that as best we can, and then allow civil defense, fire, and any anybody else who helped assist to pour all of that into one place so that Kai, you can have that total number. Okay. Um, I can make some projections based on just hours of fighting fire so that I can begin to forecast that along with damages per acre. So there's ways to forecast that. Um, and I'm developing that nexus and rationale to come up with that number so that it's grounded in sensible data. Um, that's going to take another week, though, Kai. Okay. Hey, Mike, go ahead. I know you had your hand raised, and then we'll 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 wrap this up since it's seven thirty. Okay, um, Kai. I had reported today to OHA this morning in the Board of Trustees meeting, and I, I read one statement that pertains to um, what we've gathered already as far as an assessment of damage. If if you permit me to read it. Uh, it's yeah, not very long. It's about yeah, three minutes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So um, my report was fire damage, the extent of damage. 32 beneficiaries have completed our fire damage assessment report as of 8 11 21. The estimated damage has exceeded $2 million so far. Um, and some news clarification three homes, not two, were burnt to the ground. The weather report for when we have predicted gusts of up to 45 miles per hour, we underground knew it was far more than 50. There were not hundreds of firefighters as what is being reported. There was hundreds of homesteaders and family members fighting the fire. Beneficiaries outnumbered the fire department 20 to one, even until today. Um, Wyoming Homestead set up shelter for our people immediately uh, to provide whatever we could to help them, feed them. Um, the, we had a beneficiary meeting. Our first gathering took place on 8-5 with over 40 families being represented to start the process of assessing the damages. Uh, the homestead created a reporting form which each family affected by the fire for each family. The process is ongoing. Our second meeting on the evening of 8, 10, 21, government officials requested to be present to address our people. Uh, DHHL Chairman Isla addressed the homestead victims of the fire and informed them that DHHL, DHHL has no funding to help any of them. County Mayor Roth also informed them they have no, the, the county doesn't also have any funding to, uh, to help them. Uh, Fire Chief Todd informed us that they are understaffed, poorly equipped, and did not have the capacity to fight this fire. So gov government programs such as FEMA uh, exist to reimburse the government for their expenditures and rarely make monies available to the public, with the exception of low-interest loans. Um, they talk about State Department of Ag has no, no programs to assist our ranchers, especially financially. And our last resort is to get assistance from USDA's FSA Emergency Conservation Program. Mm -hmm. that could be used to help. Um, only under these extreme circumstances of natural causes. Um, most of my investigative findings, um, when I expressed this in, the, um, in a conference call with um, OHA, was about DC organized by, by you, uh, Kai, um, wanting to make sure that FSA knew exactly what had happened uh, on this whole natural disaster. Um, I identified the areas of damages, five, five different areas, existing water lines to residents and pasture lands, either damaged by the fire or run over by the bulldozers, 27 of which were in the, our homestead properties, uh, fencing, ranching equipment and supplies, restoration of the properties, fire breaks, left five foot berms all over, zigzag through our homestead communities, um, structural damages besides the homes, there was other structural damage, and then uh, smoke, con smoke contamination and cleanup. So where the homestead is standing right now, uh, as far as the water, we've secured $20,000 from White Community Foundation, Michael Kani, Michelle Kauhane, and Diane Chadwick. They immediately responded to our request for assistance and we started the ongoing process of reimbursing our, our, our homesteaders for um, fixing their water lines. As far as the ranch, uh, ranching, 
the big question, um, fencing, ranching equipment and supplies make up the bulk of the damage. And I'll give you an example, a 200 acre ranch lot exterior fencing will cost over $100,000 to replace. There's nine of them. There's 15 acre ranch lots and about that will cost about 30,000 and there's like 15 of them. And then those 10 acre ranch lots about 20,000 and there's at least 10 of them. That's just the exterior fencing, you know? So when I it's discussed about the berms and um, just to restore our homestead properties back to its original state, um, my request to OHA was for, for $50,000 to hire uh, Hiram Rivera who brought in a D10, I believe the only D10 and a D9 with water trucks at his cost as a Hawaiian to help our people. Um, and he stayed at five consistent days and he's operated five consistent days for free because he's Hawaiian helping Hawaiians. So my request to all was to give me $50,000 to hire him to restore our homestead lands to back to its original state. It, it's, it's not useful with five foot berms cross, crisscrossing on your uh, pasture lands. And they approved it today. Um, as far as like structural damages, um, I've been talking with Council, Councilwoman Leloy about those 10 by 10 um, um, shelters doing a devastation. The fire chief also offered it. And we're considering that um, for at least, at least for three, three to five of our beneficiaries to get some kind of structure up there for them. Um, that's kind of where, where, where we at right now. And I believe we, the last of our assessments um, came in. And so now it's just a matter of me deciphering it, um, helping, but talking to them and finalizing it and then categorizing it like I did and putting the numbers together. But I'm, I'm guaranteed it's far more than $2 million. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Please bring uh, your testimony down to my office. and. Um, we have some of my staff that will be there tomorrow too, and we can capture that information. But thank you for doing that. And uh, mahalo for sharing uh, the support of uh, Hawaii Community Foundation and Micah and Michelle, um, and also the Office of Foreign Affairs. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. And you know, it, it, we, we can't thank all the volunteers enough. Um, you know, those that m many people don't even know about who we're out there on the front lines, bringing their own equipment, their own supplies, their own fuel, their own time and effort at great cost to them to address this. So we need to do what we, the message I have on this is government, that's USDA, that's myself, my office, our staff, the delegation, the federal level, we gotta do our job. Um, Councilman R uh, Richards and Leloy, they're working really hard at the county level, working with the mayor's office, but you know, the federal government's gotta do their job to help, so. Thanks, Mike, for sharing that. Anything else, Michael Ahn, com comms director? Oh, um, I have uh, no other questions right now. Um, so I think what I just wanted to do one last time is just share the, uh, the, co the contact information of uh, all of our presenters uh, just one last time. So if, if folks want to take a picture of that uh, and get that information down, other than that, we'll, we'll go ahead and just start wrapping up. Okay. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Mike. Um, and, and, for everyone on this uh, webinar tonight, uh, especially um, FSA Hawaii Acting Director Shirley Nakamura, her team, Jennifer Keeson, and uh, the FSA Team Hawaii, you know, for um, taking the time to lead our conversation on, on these critical programs. Um, also, want to acknowledge our elected officials who are on this uh, call tonight, and uh, again, Mahalo Dave um, for for being on the call at two thirty in the morning in um, Washington, D.C. And I think we have our marching orders. We know what we need to do starting tomorrow morning. And I just want to let everyone know that, uh, you know, my office is here to help in whatever way we can. And uh, my staff, uh, my full staff uh, is ready to help um, in any way that we can. Uh, my office is in Hilo. Um, it's one of the reasons we're here on Hawaii Island. And so if you need to come in and make an appointment, um, you know, given some of the COVID restrictions, we got to be mindful of. You know, we're willing to do that. If we need to jump on a Zoom, we're willing to do that as well. And you can always give us a call at 808-746-6220. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, mahalo to everyone who joined us tonight. And again, have a great evening. And we look forward to working with all of you. Aloha. Aloha.
Aloha, Congressman. Aloha, mahalo. <laughs>